The thing is that we have this notion that there is such a thing as the truth. That's actually true and not true, right? There are laws that function. If you jump off the garage and I jump off the garage, we're both subject to the law of gravity. And we don't get to like toss the law of gravity just so that we can jump off the garage and then put it back into play, right? The law of gravity is in play all the time. But the law about truth and falsehood is a falsehood by itself, right? So the question isn't, is it the truth? It's, is it true? So extrapolate that into what it's really asking, meaning, is it true to you? Is it true to the best you? Or is it true to the worst you? Is it true to the you that hurts? Is it true to the you that is cynical and sad and angry? Or is it true to the you that offers the best of yourself to the world. Hello, you are listening to the Late Bloomer Living podcast, where we are reimagining and redefining what it means to be in midlife, where we are gathering energy, momentum, and excitement for our next chapter via candid conversations with other midlifers about their own pivots, pitfalls, and triumphs. I'm Yvonne Marchese, your host, and I'm so happy you're here. Hello, my friend. This week's episode is about healing through surrender. Sometimes we have to surrender our ideas of how we think our life should play out in order to heal and live with purpose. After a terrible loss and a journey through grief, my guest today found her path to her own healing and purpose. Dr. Susan Corso is a metaphysician, an intuitive, and an author of both fiction and nonfiction. She has had a spiritual consulting practice for over 40 years, and her latest nonfiction books are the eight Energy Integrity Workbooks. They teach applied practical knowledge of how your chakras reflect your past, how your chakras can be changed in the present, and how to use your own human energy system to create your future. You might immediately get your hackles up when you hear the word chakras, but I invite you to stay with us and listen to this fascinating conversation Question your own beliefs and stay open to finding your own truth through Susan's story. Before we get started, here's your reminder that the next Zoom gathering for the Midlife Uprising community is on December 6th, and we will be having some holiday fun, my friend. Have you ever been to a Zoom scavenger hunt? Well, it's back by popular demand. Consider this your official invitation to join in. You can get more information at midlifeuprising.com, but you don't have to go there right now. I'll remind you at the end of the episode, and there's a link to it in the show notes as well. Okie dokie. Without further ado, here's Dr. Susan Corso. Let's go. Hey, Susan. Thank you so much for being with me today. My sincere pleasure, Yvonne. It's lovely to see you. Thank you. Yeah. So, gosh, where to start with your story? I, um, uh, you know. <laughs> in the middle. In the middle, right? As in we do. Middle. As Absolutely. we do here in Late Bloomer Living. So, so st- <laughs> it's kind of like Star Wars, right? They start you right in the middle of the action, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> and then go back and fill in the backstory. So, right. um Usually when I start to tell sort of how I got into metaphysics and living the way I live, the easiest answer and the clearest answer and also the um, put the brakes on seatbelt on answer is through tragedy. So I had this T in the road experience that changed everything for me. And that is that I had a son who died the day he was born. And I'm so sorry. Thank you. 
yeah, uh, uh, as I can now say many, many years later, the best worst thing that ever happened to me. It was an utter T in the road for me because um, I realized that I couldn't stay in bitterness and rage and hurt and anger because it would ruin me for life. And it would ruin my life for me, really. My grandmother was a very bitter, angry woman because she lost her first child. Mm. My mother lost her first child. Mm. I then found out that my great grandmother lost her first oh child. Oh my goodness! Wow! So all the way back, and on both sides of my family. Wow! So I said, "All right, I got to stop this pattern. I don't care how I do it. I don't care who I have to see to do it. But I'm getting this done." So, raised in no religion whatsoever. I mean, I sang in a church choir, but it was about singing, not about God. Um, this is the truth. <laughs> but anyway, um, I didn't know where to go for answers. So I went to God Almighty and said, excuse me, but my kid dying before me is exactly the wrong thing. So hello, Whiskey Tango Foxtrot Buster. And I was mad, mad as all get out and nine months into the experience namely after my son died i wasn't better i wasn't better at all and had been known to you know walk past the diapers in a grocery store and leave my entire cart there and have to leave the store because i mm. couldn't find, i mean it it is shocking how much is reminding one of babies when one doesn't have one. So long, long, long story short, a woman showed up in my meditation nine months to the day that Isaac was born. And she said, hi. And I said, hi. She said, I'm Mary. I said, hi, Mary. Um, and she kind of looked at me and said, uh, Jesus, mom? I went, oh. And then she vanished completely vanished mm -hmm. uh so so what is jesus mother doing showing up in my meditation not a jesus person not a christian don't know really anything about it particularly hmm and so she showed up every single day for nine months checking on me mm. never said another word nine months after that so now it's we're 18 months in I found out many, many years later that often human grieving goes in nine month increments because it replicates the gestation period. Hmm. So it tends to get worse after nine months, after 18 months, after 27 months, you go back in and get a deeper part of the grief than you did before. So the 18 month mark, she showed up again and she said, um, do you want to know how I did it? I knew instantly what she meant. I said, yes. And she said the four words that totally changed my life, which were, I gave him away. Okay. So I gave my Isaac to the purposes of the universe. Let there mm. be good from this. I don't care what it is. Let there be good from this. Let there mm. be good. Let there be blessing. Let there be joy. And actually, we named him Isaac because it means she laughed in Hebrew because we wanted joy out of this experience, my husband and I. Wow. And um, I started to heal. I st instantly, the pain eased. My heart stopped aching. I started to lose weight. I started to not look pregnant anymore. Uh, I mean, it was, it was that fast. So I did the work. 
I went deep and I figured out why I was so angry. I figured out why I was so hurt. I figured out what was actually going on. I figured out the purpose that Isaac had had. And I learned something extraordinary, which is that human, uh, human children, human beings, all babies and grownups and everybody in between has a purpose, has a mission. And they have, we have souls and our souls make agreements. My Isaac needed to be here for nine months and two hours. He was done with his mission at the end of that. He went home. Later, mom. Off he went. Okay. Well, what happened was I went back to the Blessed Mother and I said to her, you saved my life. Thank you. Can I work for you? And I consider her the original Jewish mother, of course. <laughs> and uh, she said, sure, come work for me. There are all kinds of people who work for me. So I've worked for her ever since. And that was 30, um, three years ago. Wow. And what and did that she, look like when, when you started working for her? Um, I started being able to take the place where I was hurt the most, okay? So human beings' bodies are fascinating because scar tissue is the strongest tissue that the body ever makes, right? It doesn't matter if it's scar tissue in a bone or, you know, scar tissue because you cut your hand in the kitchen. Where there's a scar, that's the strongest uh, I love structure. that. Yeah, that makes me think of what's that, that, Japanese art with the gold on the cracks in the... Uh, yes. I, yeah. I don't remember the name of it, but I know what you mean. Yeah. So um, I started to be able to help people with their own mother wounds because I was a mother that had been wounded and able to fix it. And all kinds of us have mother wounds and we have mother wounds for all kinds of reasons, right? I mean... You know, we love to think of it that as being, um, you know, uh, uh, the evil mother who, you know, the mommy dearest mother who beats you with wire hangers and things. But there's a whole lot more gray area in mother wounding than that. Yes. That's and speaking and speaking as a mother, I'm sure, you know, my kids are going to need some sort of therapy <laughs> based on what I did with all the best of intentions. <laughs> That's exactly right. I mean, I actually, when I, I'm a minister. And so when I do weddings, I tell people start, if you're going to have kids, start saving your money for therapy now. It's designed for them to need therapy. It's okay. <laughs> right? It's totally okay. Um, but by being able to name and help people with mother wounds from the place that was the most wounded in me, and I grew up with an alcoholic mother and alcoholic grandparents. So I had mm -hmm. my very own mother wound already, mm -hmm. right? But when I lost a child, then the whole thing came full circle. And I said, oh no. I said, I don't care who you are, God almighty, because here's what we're doing here. We're healing this so that no other woman in my family loses their firstborn kid, not one, whatever karma this is, whatever lesson this is, whatever ancestral curse, blah, whatever, I'm done. It stops here. And when my niece um, got pregnant, she did not lose her first baby, which was awesome. <laughs> totally awesome. None of the girls in my family have lost a baby because I was like, yeah, no. We're done. We're done here. And part of it was a lineage of mother wounding that had to be cleaned up. Mother wounding is, is you know, primal wounding. And it's primal in the sense that most of the time, most of us receive mother wounds before we have the emotional uh, facility to describe what that is, right? I mean, think about a, 
who gets mad, right? A three-year-old doesn't get annoyed or resentful or frustrated or ticked off, right? A three-year-old gets mad. They're mad, they're mad for 90 seconds. And then in they're watching a Barney video and everybody's happy again. We don't learn that sort of subtlety in emotional parsing really until we're in our 20s, which is why I say that there really are only four emotions. If they don't rhyme, they don't count. <laughs> it only works in English, but they are <laughs> mad, bad, sad, glad. Mm. The rest are intellectual variations, right? You can be as frustrated or annoyed as you want, but the bottom line, darling, is you're mad. So get mad. Right? No, no, we parse it out so we distance ourselves from the feelings. So what I started to be able to do was invite people in to the feelings and make a safe space for them to be okay because of my own wounding. And I go around telling women who are afraid to have their first baby, don't worry about it. It's not a pathology. It's the best experience you will ever have in your body in your entire life. And trust yourself. You will know when to breathe. You will know when to push. You don't have to be afraid. Yeah, it hurts. Okay, breathe, swear, good, right? You get a baby at the end most of the time. How awesome is that? And I tell them that I lost a child and people are like horrified that I'm being encouraging. Why? He did what he came here to do. And because of the wounding, my intuition was really, really strong. I was able to help people quickly. I've always been able to lay my hands on people and help them heal. Um, I've understood about energy and life force. And it's basically why I started working with the chakra system. Um, and that is the chakra system, I believe, is the life force. And you can call the life force anything you want. You can call it you know, prana or mana or chi or ki or whatever, you call it herald. It doesn't care. And I certainly don't care. <laughs> but the bottom line is something makes your circulatory system want to circulate. And it's not just that you have a pump called the heart, right? It's in the nature of a circulatory system to circulate. It's in the nature of a respiratory system to respire. What is that, right? I call that life force. Well, when you look at the life force through a prism, that's how you see the chakra system. Now the chakra system, I believe is essentially your subconscious mind and mine, right? Nobody really knows where the subconscious mind lives, right? It's not in the brain. The mind and the brain are two different things. Yes, you have a brain up here. It lives here in the cranium. And that brain does an awful lot of things, right? Fortunately, 90% of them are subconscious. And the reason that's fortunate is because my eyelashes are growing right now and I am making bone marrow right now. And I have not thought once about that since I started talking to you, Yvonne. Not once, <laughs> right? And thank God, because if I was in charge of actually making bone marrow and talking to you at the same time, our conversation wouldn't be as good. <laughs> right? Thank God. Okay. But there is an emotional, intellectual, and spiritual aspect to that subconscious mind that's making blood, bone marrow. Yeah. But it's also recording everything that ever happened to me. It has a recording of every event that ever happened, every terrible Thanksgiving dinner you ever ate when, with everyone arguing, right? I mean, grow up in an alcoholic family. Thanksgiving dinner is hell. Right. Okay. Um, but it's your record. It's your emotional, intellectual, spiritual record, which is why when you work with the chakra system, particularly for healing, what happens is you're able to make change and you're able to make change, not fast, but permanently because you get to originating events. That's what's recorded in the chakra system. Hmm. So like this, here's a story. <clears throat> I had a woman come to me who I was actually, I was the head of a, of the spiritual and energy medicine departments at a big medical center in Boston. 
and I worked with 20, 20 doctors and they sent me the people that weren't getting well or that their their Western modalities had touched to a degree, but they weren't like healing. They were getting by, they were getting better, but they were, you know, 60% instead of 80% better. So this woman came to me and she was an opera singer, an extraordinary opera singer. And she had a whole tour uh, booked of German opera houses one summer. <clears throat> Excuse me. But she had lost the top third of her range and been to ENTs up and down the West Coast, up and down the East Coast, been in Europe, gotten help. Nothing worked, nothing worked, nothing worked. So finally somebody sent her to me. And she said, I don't know what you're going to do, but this is what's happened. And I just looked at her and I got really quiet and I listened and I finally said to her, um, how old were you when you had the abortion? I thought her eyes were going to fall out of her face. She said, 14. And I have never told another soul. How do you know that? I said, well, I have a good boss. <laughs> and she tells me things that I need to know when I need to know them. So I said, were you raised Catholic? And this is not Catholic bashing. This is what happened with this one person. Mm -hmm. And she said, yes, I was. And I said, and at 14, were you a practicing Catholic? Oh, yes, I was in Catholic school. Mm -hmm. Okay. I said, are you a practicing Catholic now? She said, oh, no, I gave that up ages ago. It didn't make any sense how they treated women. I said, well, okay. But the person who drew conclusions about herself at age 14 for having an abortion was a practicing Catholic. Mm -hmm. And so what you have done is you have condemned yourself. So I'm going to give you two words. I'm going to say them. And if you say them as often as you can over the next week, you'll be able to sing again. And she just went, right. You know, her eyeballs at the ceiling. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I said, okay, here you go. Te absolvo. Hmm. Which is what a priest says at the end of confession. And certainly it's what a priest would have said to her at age 14 when they were still doing that sort of thing in Latin. I absolve you is what that means. So she started to cry and said, I have nothing to lose. I'll do it. And within 10 days, she could sing again. She went off to Germany and did her tour and everything was great. Wow. Well, okay. She's an opera singer. Where else was she going to place a wound in her throat? Hello? Wow. Well, that makes sense. Her throat chakra said, oh, no, you are going to suffer until you figure this out. Well, what I said to her was, how do you know that you didn't do God and that soul a service by letting that being come and be in your body for six weeks. Maybe that soul only needed those six weeks. And God is extraordinarily grateful to you. Well, I find that that's actually the work I do all the time. I tell stories. I tell stories. But I tell the story that someone just told me in a way that gives it meaning. And that's what I had to do with my Isaac. I had to get meaning. Mm, that is everything, isn't it? We are meaning making <clears throat> machines. <laughs> that's beautiful, meaning making machines. Right, and we, <laughs> that's what we do. It, the, I, I think that is that is human nature is to have a story to create a story to explain what happens to us and I guess the real question is 
whether or not the story is true. I'm going to put in quotes. <laughs> and and does the story really serve us? Right? I mean, that that's kind of what I'm exploring with this whole podcast is in this particular instance, the story that we have, that I believe we've all absorbed about aging and what that means and how we take that and personalize it for ourselves and what we tell ourselves we're capable of at this point in our lives. If we, I'm, I know there's a question for you in here somewhere, but I'm, I'm working to get to it. If we, we're here at this point in our lives and we might be, let's say, highly successful in our career or we have a successful marriage or we have success somewhere in our lives. And then there's those other areas of our lives that always seem to be the sticking points where we can't get past ourselves or we can't get around a thing that is a constant, uh, a constant block. And then that becomes our story about ourselves, right? That this is just who I am. This is, but is it true? And so I, I guess my question to you is, well, I have so many questions, but, <laughs> but um, for you, from your personal experience, where do you, has midlife, has aging, has, has that brought about, like, what's been your experience of it? Do you find more facility as you get older to, because of the work you do in particular with storytelling, with changing the story, do you find you're more facile now with practice at your age? Is it still something that you, do you have your own blocks that you, that you? <laughs> yes, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even close to ascending. I'm actually <laughs> sitting solidly in this chair. <laughs> um, I understand what you're asking me. So here's here. There are two answers to the question. One is a personal answer and one is how it works in my professional life. So in my professional life, because I've had a counseling practice, a spiritually based counseling practice for 40 years. I will be actually, I will be 65 in 12 days. Happy early so, birthday. Oh, thank this, you. The podcast will probably come out after that. So happy <laughs> birthday. <Okay. laughs> um, <laughs> you are the first person to wish me that. So thank you. Um, <laughs> yes, of course, I have my own personal blocks that I still work on. Absolutely. I am nowhere near ascending. However, What's happened is, because I've done this for so long, it, I far more facilely recognize patterns in people, except, and you see, here is the magic of it. If I walked into the grand ballroom at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, and there were 250 people in the room, and all those people wanted to lose five pounds, right? Okay, that's a simple goal lose five pounds. You can do that in all kinds of ways, but all of, I wouldn't have a, a prescription for any of them. And the reason I wouldn't have that prescription is because every single one of those 250 people would have it wired differently in their chakra system. Do you want to lose five pounds do you want, because you want to fit in the dress that you wore to your high school reunion at the 20th year? Do you want to fit into five pounds, be, uh, lose five pounds because that's going to make your cholesterol better? Do you want to, you know, what are, what story are you telling yourself about the why? And is that story motivating you? Is that story helping you? Is that story hindering you? Is that story worse? hurting you 
And are you by telling and retelling and retelling and retelling that story, simply reinforcing the neural pathways in your own brain so that you believe it's true, right? So here's, here's another personal story. My dad was killed in a plane crash when I was five. Awful thing to happen. Mm. Um, and that was in the days before they notified next of kin. So my mother heard it in the ra- on the radio in the car on the way to pick him up at the airport with oh me goodness. in the car. Oh yeah, it was gosh. awful. Huh. Right. Well, they changed that law, believe me. <laughs> um, but the story I used to tell was that anyone I ever loved died. Right. Well, how's that for setting up a really good romantic relationship? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dreadful, right? Until the day I realized, huh, wait a minute. The story I told about that was that the people who loved me abandoned me. My viewpoint is that I felt rejected. Was I rejected? Not at all. I went, wait a minute. Well, of course, I quit telling the abandoned story. So those neural pathways eased and went Mm. away because Mm. I gave different meaning to what happened, right? Now that's a very dramatic story. Here's another one. You go to the lab and you give blood and two days later the phone rings and the lab says, oh my God, we're really sorry. We lost your sample, you have to come back. And you go, rap, 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 waste of time. How annoying. Blah, 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 blah. Bad lab, bad lab, bad lab. And you tell your bestie on the way there. But you go and you give your blood again, right? Well, okay. So if you walk in and the lab tech says to you, oh my God, I'm so glad to see you. I'm really, really sorry this happened. But I have to tell you something really good happened because of it. And that is that I was able to get the boss to really pay attention to the fact that we needed to change the entire protocol so that this never happens to anyone again. So thank you for coming back. We'll take your blood. There'll be no charge and there'll be no charge for the first one either. And you helped our business. So thank you very much, right? So you get on the phone to your bestie on the way home after having given the blood and you go, you are not gonna believe this. Something amazing happened because of this. Ba, 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 ba. What, so what's, which, what's true? Hmm. The lab lost your blood, right? What's true? So here's my philosophy. If the ending isn't happy, you haven't gotten to the end. That's how you measure your story. And you know what else I find amazing is that, as you've pointed out through these stories, it really is just the whatever story we assign to something is is all based on our perspective. Mm. It's all story. It's not it's not fact necessarily. There are maybe facts in there. So I guess what I'm getting to is that how much more empowering for us to be able to take the story and if it's not true anyway (laughs) why not go with something that makes you feel better that gives you better juice for going forward why not there is no reason not the thing is that we have this notion that there is such a thing as the truth that's actually true and not true right there are laws that function, if you jump off the garage and I jump off the garage, we're both subject to the law of gravity. And we don't get to like toss the law of gravity just so that we can jump off the garage and then put it back into play, right? The law of gravity is in play all the time. But the law about truth and falsehood is a falsehood by itself. Right. So the question isn't, is it the truth? It's, is it true? So extrapolate that into what it's really asking, meaning, is it true to you? Is it true to the best you? Or is it true to the worst you? Is it true to the you that hurts? Is it true to the you that is cynical and sad and angry? Or is it true to the you that offers the best of yourself to the world? Is it true to your scar tissue or is it true to the scab or is it true to the wound? 
right? Oh, well, okay. You can tell a story that's true to the wound if you want, but eventually, if you're still alive, all wounds heal. They do. Now, if you have a wound that makes a scab and every time there's a scab on the wound, you tear it off by revisiting the wound, mm. you got a problem, right? That's what we do. Well, okay, but then what ability do I have? Where is, where is my power? My power is in understanding that if I want something to be different, guess who gets to change? Me. And I can. I can change anything I want to change. Now, I'm probably not ever going to be taller than 5'3". Not in this life. But <laughs> there are things I can change. And mostly I change them by changing my mind. Right? Most people... Uh, uh, most people understand that we were given essentially two things by divinity. We were given the life force and we were given free will, right? But most of us don't live based on free will. We live based on free won't, <laughs> right? <laughs> what I don't want. Oh, I just don't want you to feel sad about that. Well, if you're sad, honey, I want you to feel sad. I do. Because then I'll be sad with you and we'll be sad together. And then we'll get over it and go have a latte. Right? I mean, uh, it's instead of, I think this is the most important thing I ever figured out, is that if you don't live from inside out, it's only a matter of time before your life starts to hurt. It's got to be inside out. That outside in business where you're supposed to control absolutely everything in your environment. Oh, my God. You can't control what's outside you. You know, we were given dominion in scripture. That dominion exists between two ears, your own. Here's where dominion is, totally. So I believe that you can change anything. And the fastest way to do that is to work with your chakra system. Because can I ask you a question. I want yes. to, it's been burning a hole in my brain. So, so, <laughs> so <clears throat> Mary came to you and you asked her if you could work for her. And this is a very Western Catholic belief, right? That Mary, Mary comes from this Western tradition. And yet your work is through the chakras, which is the very Eastern, I think. Mm -hmm. Hindu, um, yes. And <clears throat> so how did you get into chakra work? So connect it for me. And yeah. how do you tie <laughs> that all together seamlessly in the way that you seem so comfortable with? Um, I have no interest in converting you. If you're happy being a Catholic, great. I'll talk to you about Jesus and Mary. If you're happy being a Hindu, I'll talk to you about Lakshmi. If you're happy being Baha'i, be Baha'i. I'm good with that. I I don't need you to agree with me and I'm not in the business of conversion, which is how I've had a spiritual practice because what I do is I counsel people based on your understanding of God, right? So if you don't want to call it God, I don't care. And I don't think God cares. I think the truth is that if you understand that there is a plan that functions here and you have a place in it, Good enough. So given that, right, and Mary's guidance, I think Mary's guidance is about women. So a lot of my work has been about empowering women and empowering, <clears throat> excuse me, people to empower women. So I fell into chakras because... A friend of mine gave me a psychic reading for my 25th birthday. And I walked into this woman's house. She knew my name. That was it. And she said to me, oh, my God, you should be reading for me. You're much more intuitive than I am. <laughs> so hmm. I laughed. So she said one of the things she said to me was that I was a color healer in Egypt. <laughs> right. I thought, okay, next you're going to tell me I was Cleopatra. You know, I've heard those stories. Like, oh, no, 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 no. And 
So a friend of mine was meeting me there and taking me out for my birthday. My, this was my 25th birthday. So we went out for dinner and I'm telling her about all this. And she said, well, East West Books is around the corner, which was a spiritual bookstore in New York City in those days at the bottom of Fifth Avenue. And she said, let's go and look for books on color healing and see if there's anything that strikes you, right? Okay. So we went and I stood in front of color books and three of them fell on the ground in front of me. Hmm. <laughs> my friend, my friend's name was Susan. I turned to her. I said, Suze. She said, yeah, I just get the books. Let's not talk about this. Just get the books. So I get the books. <laughs> and I'm 50 pages into the first one. And I look up at her and I go, you know, what's really weird. She said, no, what? I said, I know this. Hmm. I, I don't, I don't know how I know this. But I know this and I know that it applies. I know that color applies to healing somehow. And this is before I ever had the word chakra, fell over the word chakra, I didn't know. And chakra is a Sanskrit word that actually means wheel. And I, I thought, wow, okay. And uh, I started using color on aches and pains, just intuitively. I kept pursuing the color thing and eventually fell across the notion of chakras. And all of a sudden, every bit of any color or healing anything started to make sense to me because it was a structure within a human being. Most people th think of chakras as being these sort of flat hockey pucks that attach to the spine like they're a ribbon, you know. They're not. Mm -hmm. They're three-dimensional spheres of light, right? And they actually hang sort of in the middle of your body as though, you know, from the top of your head in the center. Right? They go the colors of the rainbow from red at the bottom of your spine all the way through what I, my, I use eight chakras instead of seven. The eighth one is the is rose and it's in front of your thymus gland. And it has to do with emotional immunity as well as physical immunity. And by connecting, first of all, connecting to the chakras, but more to the point, and this is one of the ways I teach them that most people don't, um, it doesn't matter that they're discreet, just like it doesn't matter that you know what middle C is. You know, you can press middle C on a piano and I could say to you, Yvonne, this is music. And you would say to me, no, it's not. There needs to be another note if there's music, right? It's the second note that makes there be music, right? The important po point about the chakras isn't that there's a red disc in your body. <laughs> it's that the red talks to the orange and the orange talks to the yellow and the yellow talks to the green and they go together and they work together. Chakras are constantly changing. Like an aura is constantly changing. And I actually believe that the chakras um, generate the aura. But I mean, you, all of us have walked into a room where people have been arguing and gone, oh, ooh, I don't want to be in this room, right? Ick, this energy feels bad. And, you know, we roll our eyes of energy, blah, 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 blah. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Energy's a real thing. There are people that you meet that you just want to snuggle with, right? Or at least have a cup of tea and a chat, you know, because you're fascinated or you really connect, right? But there are other people that you meet that you're like, oh, if I met you in a bar, I wouldn't give you my phone number, mm -hmm. right? What is that? That's energy. And we're not taught that we have an energy system. You know, when a medical doctor goes to medical school, they study 11 systems. So the 12th system of the human body is the energy system. And we can learn to manage it just like we learn how to brush our teeth. That would be, if I could make a wish, you know, for my birthday, it would be to have everyone have a disc drop into themselves that they understood about human energy and how to manage their own, right? How many people do you know who you say, you know, how are you? And they roll their eyes and they're exhausted. 
all the t too much to do, too much or to they think say, through. I'm fine. I'm fine. Oh, right. Fine. Right. And you but, you totally see it. The, the, no. Right. Like, oh, wait. <laughs> that's what you're saying to get through the day. <laughs> that's right. But you know what? You actually can be fine if <clears throat> you learn to work with your energetic system and you learn how to nourish it. Right? But we don't. We're not taught this. I think we should be taught the energy system like we're taught to brush our teeth. That mundane, right? If you checked in with your chakras every single morning, you would get a message and you get the message from your body. And the reason you get the message from your body and the coolest thing about bodies in the whole wide world is that bodies don't lie. And bodies don't lie because they can't, which is awesome. Right, so you go to work on Monday and you have a little tickle in your throat, right? You know you should stay home, but oh, let's go off for drinks after work. Blah blah blah. Off you go. You have drinks. You're out till two in the morning. You don't get enough sleep. And Thursday you stay home from work because you haven't paid attention to that little tickle on Monday, right? We get messages like that all the time. We get energetically ill before we get physically ill. The reason is because energy is faster than the physical body. The physical body is dense, energy is faster. So if you learn to pay attention to your own energetic system, you can actually work toward much more wellness than most of us think is possible. And by using Western methods, that's true. It's incredible what we can't see that can't see energy necessarily i mean we i think we we do see it in somebody's face we see that translation right or in their posture or in but it always amazes me like you think about enzymes hormones all the little things that neurotransmitters affect, right all the things that are going on that, that, again, we don't see. And so, but, but the effect it has, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to wrap our heads around it. I mean, that, one of the reasons I wanted to ask you about the connection between, you know, Mary and the chakras is because I believe in God. And I, th I think God talks to us in whatever way we're able to process it. Amen to and, that. And yes. that's why I think there's so many religions and so many belief systems and so, so, such a wide variety of um, institutions based around the idea of a belief system. And um, I don't think any of them are wrong. I don't necessarily think. No, but I think they're software. The, yeah, it's it's a way they're software. Of, yeah, amazing, isn't it? Right, right. If you don't, I mean, if you don't like Word, you don't have to use Word. Use Pages. We're good, <laughs> right? I don't think that that divinity cares about the format. So if you find God on the golf course, darling, make a tea time. That's how I feel. It makes me a very very strange minister right? And other ministers don't like it. But I don't think that you find God only in particular buildings at particular times. God has been much more present in my life than that, right? You can get a message from the side of a bus. You, you know, what, are you listening? Are you paying attention? Are you connecting? You know, why is it that when you walk into somebody's office in your office every single day, every single time you, you encounter this person, your stomach sinks? Your stomach is telling you something. Stop. Mm -hmm. Ask your stomach. One of the things about the chakra system is that it's impossible to monetize it. There's no insurance code for, for working on your chakra system. There just isn't. And you don't need a teacher. You don't need a mat. You don't need a book. You need your own attention. You can do chakra work at a red light. 
seriously that simple now that sounds disingenuous coming from me because i wrote books about how to work with chakras but there's a reason i wrote work books and not just a regular book i'm not interested in handing out people handing information out about chakras there's a million books about that no no i'm interested in teaching people how to work with them that's why there are workbooks cuz you do the work i wrote the book right you can get them on amazon but they're about doing the work to know your own energy system they take you through the past the present and the future with each chakra so there are eight workbooks and they all teach you how you work to use them to help you and it's amazing what people can do when they pay attention to themselves it is amazing like what you what you said earlier about um therapy and the idea that um just knowing what is stopping you or what has been a problem getting to the basis is going to help you change i think where i come from and and let me ask you this um is that it's the beginning it's the beginning point is the awareness like just be for me i'll, I'll go back to a personal story um for me it, it came from being aware or becoming aware that i was complaining all the time that i was complaining to in in conversations with friends you know how you doing and this was back in my 40s when I was I was going through uh whatever I was going through it was it was it was a time and I I could hear myself complaining and I thought gosh what a drag I must be to talk to right now <laughs> and, and and that's not who I was my whole life this was this was new this was different this was um and I was like, wow, wow, the complaining already. Oh my gosh, what a drag. And no, everybody was very kind to me about it. Nobody was like, Yvonne, you know, <laughs> girl. Um, nobody called me out and I kind of wish they had. But I, so for Lent one year, I decided to try to give up complaining. And what that did was just make me aware of, oh my gosh, how much I'm complaining. And it's not <laughs> just in conversations with other people. It's in my mind in a loop all the time. I have complaint after complaint after complaint. And I'm like, well, okay, if I have these complaints. So, so awareness was the first thing for me that was like, oh, okay, now I'm aware I'm doing that. So that gave me a moment of choice about like so once I started getting good at noticing it I would I started to get good at noticing it in the moment and then I had a choice in the moment about what I was going to do with that complaint was I and, and was it from a place of as we were talking about earlier truth which truth what kind of truth and you know and and it just gave me facility but then as you're talking about, then, then there's the work or maybe the play of, of flipping it maybe, or playing with it or, you know, choosing, making choice, doing like having the facility to choose differently, to give it a different story. And then with the power of having a different story in my mind, that affecting like how I was feeling about it, giving me then a different kind of energy to go forward with and take different action. And then like, like a, like a, like a, a like a boulder coming down a hill, it, it just sped up and sped up and sped up, you know? Mm -hmm. So you took your awareness and used free will. You said, hmm, do I like this? Do I like this story? Do I like this complaining story? 
a lot of people are really satisfied in their complaints. Some people like to complain about anything or criticize or control or, I mean, there's a million of them, right? Almost all of them having to do with the power of speech. What we say causes energy leaks more than anything else, right? Mm. Let's go to lunch. Oh, yes, let's. You don't mean it. How about you say instead, you know what, really thanks for the invitation, but I'm just not going out to lunch these days. I'm too busy. Clean, finished, done, not hanging out in cyber somewhere, unfinished. Let's not go to lunch. Let's not be nice, right? Let's be truthful, but kindly, right? You, you still have a right to complain if you want to. Mm -hmm. But having that be your primary interaction with reality wasn't working for you anymore. Yeah, and 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 what I'm exploring now is what well goodness, so maybe the complaints are actually useful at certain points. That's like information. Oh, oh, look at that. And but there's like now it's like again starting with awareness is like okay, I'm aware of the complaint. What's it telling me? And then the curiosity comes in, right? Staying curious about, yeah. <laughs> well, and curious is really interesting. Curious is one of the few uh, neutral emotional stances you can take. You're not ever really, I mean, you can be intensely curious about something Yes, as I that that's my rabbit hole brain. That that's some sometimes a squirrel brain. Like I'll, I'll I'll get intensely curious about something, and then I'm deep in, and I got to do the research. And oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, tell me more. Tell me more. Right, exactly. But, but then there's the curious that comes from like sitting and meditating and just going, oh, oh, inter interesting. Or if I'm having a hot flash. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes. And I sit in the middle of the hot flash sometimes, and it you know it's. It's like I could get frustrated or I could get curious about the experience. Like, hmm, where does it start? Oh, gosh, it starts there in my chest and then it radiates out and then it goes up into my head. And, ah, oh, interesting. What's the purpose of a hot flash? Why do they exist? <laughs> like, and all of a sudden, the, like, the, the curiosity releases me from the frustration. Well, and it brings sense. you to witness. It brings you to witness what is self-acknowledgement is, ah, I see you. I see me, essentially, right? It's spirit self, your deepest, highest self, however you want to name it, right? Watching your ego self and your ego self not being in charge. The ego self is in charge when you feel like you have to control absolutely everything and everybody, right? Or you're complaining all the time. And instead, you're taking the complaints in and you're going, okay, what can I learn here? How can I grow here? What is helpful here? What is useful here? What is timely here, right? And the, I love that you picked complaints. Um, I have, a, I have a gift I'd actually like to offer your listeners, um, which is something I call the less mores. And the less mores are two practices, one for each chakra, one to do less and one to do more. And the first chakra, less, is complain less. Mm. And the more is thank more. Mm. Oh, yeah. Right? <laughs> So well, key. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. but the cool thing about it is complaints sometimes generate from you, but also if you are working, let's say in an environment where everybody's complaining, you can see complaints external to you as well as internal to you, right? I bet your complaints gave everybody you knew much more freedom to complain than they have now. Mm. Right. Probably. Probably. Oh, okay. 
So maybe if I want to stop that, if I notice complaints external to me, I notice complaining internal to me, hmm, everything's a mirror. Maybe I should do something different, right? It doesn't really matter what you do differently. Stand on your head. Do a salute to the sun, you know, bow, curtsy, do a silly dance, do whatever you need to do to change the subject, right? Mm, the yeah. less mores. Yeah, it's like um, when my kids were little and, they, you know, something that I would just change the scenery. Let's go outside. Right, right, right. right when I was exactly. being success, when I was being <laughs> a good, thoughtful mom. And right. Instead of reacting to them having a tantrum. Right, exactly. You know, amazing how change, like, if we could just mother ourselves like that more. Well, I think that's true. Um, if, you're, if your listeners would like to get the lesson words, they may have them for free. You don't Thank have to you. put your email address in. <laughs> how, so how do they do that? Chakras.SusanCorso.com. Okay. And there, there are two digital downloads. They're the same, except that they're, they look different because I'm a Libra and I couldn't decide between them. <laughs> they were too pretty. I said, no, no, these are too pretty. You have to, you, you can have both. Um, and then another screen will come up and invite you to be on my mailing list if you want to be, but you're not paying for the gift with you. It's one of the, is, my my crazinesses. <laughs> that is a beautiful thing. I, I love that. Thank you so much. Man, Susan, this conversation has been mind-blowing. I have loved going into this territory with you and exploring. I have love the way you talk about this. I just, I don't know what else to say. Thank you. Thank you. It's, <laughs> oh. it's important that it not be, so many people who talk about chakras and this kind of stuff talk about it, I think in a way that makes it unapproachable. This isn't some crazy woo thing. You don't, you know, you, you don't need stones and, you know, flags and it's, it's really simple. And it's really good for you. That's, that's the thing. It's fi fi finally why I started, instead of just doing one on one counseling, I started, you know, doing podcasts and talking to people about this work is you can do this for yourself. And I want everybody on the planet to know how to do it. But let's start with women over 50, shall we? Because we're the ones who are actually gonna do it. <laughs> it's really right. how I feel. <laughs> That's right. At least the people listening to this podcast, I hope, you know, I, I'm all about us making some waves as we get older and let's, you know, let's try something you've never tried before. Because, you know, you keep doing the same things you've been doing, where's that gonna get you? You're going to get the same results. Exactly. How about something new? How about something yeah. new and easy and costing nothing? What do you have anything coming up that you're excited about? Uh... Oh, yes. Two things. One is that I write a series of mystery novels. Right. We didn't even talk about that. Well, oh I write a series yes. of mystery novels uh, called The Mex Mysteries. They're about an intuitive in investigator who solves her cases by listening to a voice in her head called Spirit. Um, and the ninth one, I have been, they all take place around a musical. So uh, like a Broadway musical. So the first uh, book is called Oklahoma Hex and it takes place around a production oh of Oklahoma. Gosh, how fun. Oh they're, my gosh. They're, to they're totally fun. Well, the ninth one is based on the musical Rent. And I spent 625 days trying to get the lyric reprint rights because the solve of every single mystery is in the lyrics of the show. So <laughs> I finally got them yesterday and the book is for up for pre-sale on Amazon and it will be uh, out on the 5th of October. And then on the 12th of October, another book I wrote, a historical fiction book called Jezebel Rising, which is about four sisters in the 1890s who don't play by the rules surprising that now that you've heard me talk <laughs> um i've written 30 books so wow. that's kind of a kind of a wow kind Prolific. of prolific yeah man, yes, oh, man. All, all on amazon and um 
Apple Books and all those. That is so amazing. You've been just a pleasure. Ah, I'm, I'm glad we met. Thank you. Thank I am you. too. My sincere pleasure. Anytime. Thank you for the freebie that you offered. I'll have that in the show notes. I'll have up the connections to the books in there for you. So if anybody, if anybody wants to find out about anything in the world of Susan Corso or chakras or anything, I'll have stuff there for you to go find. Thank you Lovely. so much. My sincere pleasure. What, what a joy, totally a joy talking to you. I hope you have a magical weekend. Thank you. Well, there you have it. You know, what stands out for me from my conversation with Susan is our power of choice. As she said, there are things I can change, and mostly I change them by changing my mind. I will tell you that has definitely been true for me. If you want to know more about Susan's books, fiction or nonfiction, or get a copy of her free download. I will have all the links for you in the show notes. You can just go to latebloomerliving.com forward slash podcast and click on the show notes for episode 120. Oh, and here's your reminder that the next Zoom gathering for the Midlife Uprising community is on December 6th. You can go to midlifeuprising.com to get more information. And of course, always feel free to email me with any questions at latebloomerliving at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you have a fantastic week. Stay safe and well. Talk soon.